Hey everybody, Pastor Darris Walden, Southwest Christian Center, and welcome to another time of wild card, which means we never know. Uh, we're totally unscripted. We don't know what we're going to talk about. We kind of guess that somewhere in the conversation we'll talk about God, but uh, we're glad you're here today. Uh, right uh, as you're watching this, don't forget that you can like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this on our channel and we want to remind you also that coming up in November this is uh, in September of 2020 coming up in November of this year we're going to be having a, just a month-long blitz we'll be giving you more specific information on that we're really having a subscriber contest uh, for our channel so uh, be watching for that today I'm really excited to have with us uh, Kathleen Fairgood and she is or called Kat and that's her nickname and she's a part of our church. Uh, Kat, welcome to Wildcard. Hi, thanks <laughs> for having me. <laughs> well, Kat, we talk right out of the gate of how did you get to where you're sitting today? Whoa, so it was definitely a broken road um, and God blessed that broken road. So. Um, I just have had person after person just so willing to invest in me to get to where I am and just um, honestly like to give God the credit for everything that he's done. It's really started back from when I was little, um, coming from a broken home with a single mom with five kids um, that did most of it or all of it by herself mm -hmm. without help. Um, we really are blessed to be here and um, to be healthy and to be all of us in our sound mind and, and, and just um, successful. So there, there's worldly success, but most importantly is like we're all like mentally and healthy and, and here and um, we just had a lot of people along that road that lifted us up and got us here, mm -hmm. thankfully. Yeah, yeah and, and of course, you're you're a you're a stay-at-home mom mm -hmm. by choice, right? Right. That uh, talk talk a little bit about that. You've done some entrepreneurial things that you made it. You and your husband made a decision to for you to be a full-time mom. Yeah. So um, I worked as um, I worked in collections. I collected on defaulted student loans Ooh. for ten years. I managed a collection agency. And it was um, a really, really good paying job, but um, I always equated it to um, kind of like a bad boyfriend because he, <laughs> he bought me really pretty things, but he treated me very poorly. <laughs> so it was um, kind of a, an abusive relationship a little bit, because, and not, not to put that lightly on abuse, abuse but it was it was tough it was a tough job and you had to kind of distance yourself from your humanity in order to um, continue to do well there so it was either um, I had people tell me I, either I'm going to feed my kids or I'm going to pay you and then my response would have to be well I'm going to garnish your wages mm. And so it was really rough, and I, I did that for a really long time, and it weighs on you. Mm -hmm. It really weighs on you. And so after I had Callie, um, uh, I went on maternity leave, and I said, I'm taking a really <laughs> as long as I can, plus extra, because I had been at the company for a year, so I had a lot of Callie's vacation. your youngest. Callie's my youngest. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of vacation built up. So I decided to take a really extended maternity leave and during that time off, it was my first time in my career since having children that I was able to have time off because I, I missed my oldest two. I have four kids and so um, I missed my oldest two growing up and um, by the time I had my fourth child, uh, my oldest was um, 13, I believe, so it was it was nice for me to take that break and just have time off and finally see my kids grow up. And a lot of people don't get that. And so when it was time for me to go back to work, I had praying over it and just 
it felt wrong to walk back into that building. Mm -hmm. I would sit in my car before work started and just pray and just sing worship songs and just, my stomach was churning. I just, I, I just had so much sickness inside of me and I'm proof that no matter how much money um, you're making, if you're just not happy there, it's just not gonna work, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you got the opportunity because God's really blessed your husband. Jason's uh, an electrician. Hey, Jason, you're doing a great job. And he's a union man. He yes. loves, I grew up in a union state, so I understand uh, how much uh, that is. But you guys have, you know, you, you know Jason works where the work. Uh, um, uh, if you're in the skilled labor field, you know that you work where the work goes. Yes. So that that's, talk about that. I mean, you, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know, we got murder hornets and stay at home school right now. You know, we got all these. Uh, so on, on a normal day, normal, quote unquote, without virus, this and that, you'd still be having to uh, gift your husband away for, for the week. Uh, talk about what what uh, life looks around the Sanders house, uh, you know, trying to manage all of that. A lot of plates spinning. Yeah, it, it really is. And so um, it was just constant 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 running around so I always um, equate my life to being an unpaid uber driver because I'm just always <laughs> driving somebody around for free so I mean yes I will get the benefit of being an involved mother uh, a present mother but I still have I'm always busy always busy and um, a lot of it was chosen for me because when you have involved kids, mm -hmm. then you're an involved parent. Right. So and my kids don't drive. So mm -hmm. if they're in a meeting, mom's in that meeting too. Right. By driving them there, picking them up. Most of my day was spent waiting in cars for my kids to come out from where they were. So, um, and then packing Jason off for weeks at a time, not knowing when he was going to be able to make it home. Um, that's really rough on us. And then since I'm here and I'm the parent, I'm the present one that makes the majority of the decisions. So even though he would support whatever I came up with, it was always me and God making those decisions right. here. So um, it's been rough, but um, well worth it. Well worth it. And um, I know the quarantine was, is not fun for a lot of people, but it slowed my life down so much and it allowed me to smell the roses um, I know that's colloquial but it's really true like I was able to um, stop and see what was important and I had my hands in so many different baskets um, wrestling we would be gone with rest pastor is an old wrestler so not old well, he <laughs> no. he's a he's a Green Bay fan so I can mess that's with right him. that's right so um, my son is a wrestler, and then my daughter is a cheerleader, and he's a wrestler and a football player. So with um, football, I thought we were busy because it was, you know, once a week we would go and watch the football games, but then wrestling came, and I had no idea what busy was until wrestling came. And I mean, it was tournaments all day yeah, long. Right. So it was, and it was every single week. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I got Callie and Jackson into wrestling, and then it was tournaments. It was it was a lot. It was a lot. But I thought as a parent, it was what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I needed to be running around after my kids and at every single game and at every single tournament and in the parent the parent club and at church, mm -hmm. doing everything I was supposed to be doing here mm -hmm. plus more because I felt like I was never doing enough for God. And I, I still feel like that, honestly. I, I'll, I'll probably always feel like that. But um, as a parent, I felt like I was not doing enough, even though I was running myself ragged and, and just falling asleep as soon as my head would hit the pillow most nights because it's just so tired. Stay, as a stay-at-home mom, I was working more than when I ran um, the, the big business of the, the collection agency, I was working more as a mom. You never get to clock out. Right. You don't get weekends off. You're not allowed to get sick either. You're not allowed to get sick. So it, it's rough, but it's it's really rewarding because I do get to be present. Yeah. And it's hard. 
it, it is hard, but um, I'm just a hopeless optimistic and I always choose to look at the positive side of things. I rarely complain about stuff. And if I do, it's usually only to God. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be a complainer. I don't like to be seen as a complainer. So um, I don't. I don't really talk about my problems. Much. So we, um, you know, we're 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 living in the U.S. We're uh, uh, a, a collection of, you know, all kinds of people came from everywhere, willing or or or, or, or unwilling, ever how our ancestry got here. Or if we're Native American, then we were here and our, our home was taken away from us. And so here we are in the year 2021 and you're a busy mom uh, and you're a person of faith. You, uh, you, know, you, you, you walk with Jesus and involved in your church. Stay at home mom, you know, you, whoever's up watching this today, you may be a grandma, you may be an aunt, you may be an uncle, you may be a, a mom yourself, but something happened through the coronavirus and still going on today, um, and that is people of color don't feel safe in, in, in the country that they live in, in that you, you live in. So um, I grew up in the Detroit area, um, very diverse community, uh, largest black population of any city uh, as far as percentage wise. So, but no part of the country holds exclusive claim to being, um, you know, even though they're culturally diverse, we have situations. So um, if you're comfortable, we can just kind of chat through this because it, it can be an emotional thing, particularly for young men. So um, let's talk about some of these things, some of the challenges and, you know, information and inspiration because we don't want to just tuck our heads and just say, well, nothing's going to work out. Yeah, true. Um, I have to say that when uh, the situation first unfolded with George Floyd, um, I had a lot of, I had a lot of anger and um, sadness mm -hmm. inside of me and I didn't know how to how to work through it I didn't know what my role was or how I was supposed to respond to what I was feeling and I felt at first hopeless and um, devastated those were my, those were my immediate feelings at first after seeing um, the video online so much. Um, I stayed offline after seeing that because I just, it was playing too much and even just scrolling past it was, was too much for me at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I had to stay away from social media. Um, I rarely watch the news anyway, so that's, that's not something I had to worry about staying away from. I just stayed away from social media because it seemed like everybody was sharing the video or there was news about it somewhere, somehow. So um, I stayed off of social media and I um, had posted a few things about how hurt I was at the time. And then I came to church to do some work and I ran into you and you gave me an opportunity to speak to you about what was happening. And that was the first time that I've spoken to anybody outside of my race about the video. Um, even though I had said online about I was feeling hurt about some things, it was the first time I had ever spoken. In my family growing up, we'd always have been educated about things like this. My mother's from Alabama, born and raised in Mobile um, during Jim Crow where she only went to black Catholic schools. And so um, she knows firsthand about being a less than citizen. And, um, but she never raised us to feel less than. So she always raised us to be who we are and to talk the way that we talk and to be intelligent. And, and not just um, because you're black, but that's just because who she was. She was raised that way. She grew up speaking Latin and you know, she, uh, 
in the church that she went to, they only spoke Latin in the, the Roman Catholic churches. So that's what she knew. So she educated her children. And um, so when I got a chance to talk to Pastor about what happened, he just asked me how I was feeling. And I just let loose on him. And he just allowed me to. And that was really nice because he gave me an opportunity to speak how I felt and um, to get that devastation out into words. And that was really great. Yeah, and I think that, uh, again, you know, it's like uh, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as blank as I'm ever going to be, you know. And so we, we uh, tend to, men and, and white men in particular, uh, sometimes we feel, well, we can just solve this by, you know, we can make another policy. I was, it was funny when I was in the military is that the military, their answer to everything was, we have a policy. So, um, uh, if a, if, you know, a woman's being sexually harassed, well, we have a policy against that. Like, you know, it's kind of like the, a sign out in front of a school, drug-free zone. And, you know, like, you know, the drugs won't be here because we have a sign right. out here. And so this is what we do in America is we, we come up with another policy or a law or whatever. And, and the, if we can come back to what we're, what's center at this is that not just my conversation with you, but the conversation with other uh, friends of mine that are in the ministry, um, and this is statistical reality, is that almost every young black man in America sometime in his life is going to have a negative encounter with the police. That is a startling reality. Almost every, not most, some, almost every, you know, uh, is going to have some negative. So, I mean, th this is a tough road to hoe because we're certainly not suggesting, especially being Christians, that we're, we're for um, lawlessness, and, right. you know. So, it, it, you know, how, do, how does a conversation, you know, we, we kind of painted a backdrop here. We've got, you know, you're, you're at home during the week. Uh, Jason has to work out of town. You've got a young man in your house. You have a godly young man in your house. So, wow, thank God 10,000 times, yeah. you know, that Boots is uh, a godly young man. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you're, you're going to educate me. You're going to educate others. Where can we, faith community, anybody, have these conversations? Where do we start? Where are we going from here? Uh, you know, we have knee-jerk reactions going on, but mm -hmm. these are ongoing conversations. We're not going to have this ultimate, today is the day we end yeah. racism. It's now over on, on this day. In, you know, it just doesn't work that way, does yeah. it? So where, where, where can we begin? Well, I think it's important to um, hear people's stories mm -hmm. and to... Um, to not just assume that because you don't see it, you don't hear it, that it's not happening. So, um, you know, it's it's the same. You can equate it to, it, it, it is a disease. It is a disease. And a lot of people have it and don't realize they have it. And it's probably not even purposely. It's just, it is, it's the way that we're raised. It is the way that we're raised and it's the circles that we keep. And um, it's the things that we say um, not meaning to be mean or not meaning to be hurtful, but um, it's just so funny how many times um, people have commented on me and my sister's names. Like, we, my name is Kathleen, my sister's name is Amber, my other sister's name is Leanne, and then I have a sister named Cassandra. And those are not, I, you know, we get told often that they're not black names. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, there it's just, it's things that... Well, I'm Darius, so I mean, that's a whole nother... <laughs> it's, it, it are, it's things that you don't necessarily, I, I mean, it, that aren't necessarily um, considered racist, but mm -hmm. can be harmful when you're told that repeatedly over life. Sure. So, um, there are, there's... Um, 
accountability that every Christian has to have. I think it starts with the church. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that it starts with the church. And there's accountability, accountability that we have to have when we are... Um, when we're hearing these things, that we just step up and um, be attentive, pray, ask for God to to show you what to do, ask for God to show you what to do and how to do it, and how to be better. I mean, what a thought that we'd actually pray and ask the Holy Spirit, you know, and, uh, and you know, again, listening is a is a wonderful skill, and so when someone has posted something on Facebook or someone in your circle of care if we just take it we're just talking about people in general it is that it is that it doesn't cost you anything to listen but it has great dividends attached to it and i don't need to try and I, I, again what i said earlier is that we have a need men white men in particular have a need that we're going to fix all we're going to we're going to um uh, we're going to make the world a better place you know and uh, uh so we're not looking for all of that you know we're just we're, we're looking for, uh, I, I really hate the word race anyway, only because uh, the Bible teaches that there is the human race. So, you know, I, I, the scriptures say that, and it's hard for us to believe this, by the way, but the first, the church, that was, in the day of Pentecost, they were all people of Hebrew mm -hmm. uh, ethnicity. And they actually didn't even believe that anyone besides people of their group mm -hmm. could be Christians. Right. I mean, it's beyond our comprehension. But it took the Holy Spirit changing their mind. Yeah. It, 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 it wasn't, I'll change my mind, then I'll get God. But it took God to come into, you know, the conversation. And Peter in Acts chapter 10 gets revealed to him. They say, oh, now I get it. Mm -hmm. That there's only one one blood. Right. They started with Adam and Eve. Every nation of mankind to dwell on the face of the earth. So it, so it's it's important for me. Just as, just as much if, um, I don't know, if, if you were from um, Spain and wanted to, I want to learn more about Spain, I'm right. gonna I'm gonna ask you questions that create conversations right. and so not to just be dismissive and say well you know slavery was 150 years ago so get over it mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we respond how should we respond to in particular slavery that was 150 years ago get over it how do we how do we respond to that I wish I knew the answer <laughs> you're on you're on YouTube you should I have <laughs> I have been told that so many times, and um, I don't, I don't know why we have to get over it. So we have, um, and I and I don't mean that we have to hold on to it. We have to, um, we have to love it. We have to embrace it. That's that's not what I want. Obviously, it was a stain on it was a stain on our history, and um, I mean I wish it would have never happened, but it did. But I also feel like things happen to you for a reason, you know? And yes, it happened to an entire people, um, just like the um, American Indians. It happened to, things happened to them that were horrible and atrocious. And they're not asked to get past it. Neither should um, African slaves. I think that it's something that we should, okay, yes, and, yes. It happened, and um, how how are you dealing with it? And, and people don't understand just because it happened years ago doesn't mean that people are not still affected by it. Mm -hmm. This it happened in the country that we live in, mm -hmm. and if you look at the disparity in our races and the things that are happening, not saying that things are not happening to Mexican Americans and white Americans because they, they there are bad things happening. Right. If you look at the ghetto still here in the United States. There are a lot of, it, there's a lot of poverty and there's a lot of broken families. And you can look at rules that were put into place to keep Negroes in place mm -hmm. that are still affecting them to this day. Mm -hmm. And same same thing with um, Native Americans that, that still have 
um, their reservations that they live on that, you know, are out of money and they look horrible. And there's a lot that America could change still to, um, and, and honestly, I don't even know if they could because there are situations where families are in poverty and impoverished and, and parents are not around and, and, and there's just so much that has happened. You know, the, um, the three strikes you're out and the, you know, these, these, these laws that were made that broke up families and, and yes, people were doing bad things. Sometimes you got to look and see why. Mm -hmm. It's not black and white as mm -hmm. to why. Right. You know, and, and then people were on drugs. It's not black and white as to why they were on drugs. Mm -hmm. We don't know. There was a lot of uh, drugs that were brought in to mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to deal with that as a culture and as a society. And we have to be less, will, less eager to look at somebody's history and say, well, you know, they, they were murdered, but, you know, they were in jail before. And more willing to say, that was a child of God. And everybody deserves an opportunity to be rehabilitated, right. regardless of what that rehabilitation may have been. Maybe their rehabilitation was in prison and they found God but stayed in prison forever. Maybe that was it. Maybe they didn't deserve to be shot and murdered. And so that's something that I have, um, everybody should be having a hard time dealing with, but a lot of people aren't. And just the ugliness that's on social media over mm -hmm. it, it breaks my heart because Easily, it could have been me, or my husband, or my children. Well, and that, that this changes everything. And I think that the, the, the conversation for change begins, this is, this is the Christian thing, this is the Christ-like thing, let me say it that way, is that we really can't expect or have empathy for change until we really identify, truly identify, with that could have been my son, that could have been my daughter, that could have been my mom, that could have been my dad. You know, it, it's that, you know, in, in our Christian upbringing, we are 100% against something until it knocks on our door. Right. And then we start, we start really thinking it through. Does it make, it, 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 I, I, Faith and I were talking, my wife Faith and I were talking about uh, prison and jail last night and people are in a cell and the word cell originally wasn't for a place for a person to be locked away from other people in a negative context it was where monks went to meditate and spend time with God even the word penitentiary penitentiary comes from the Quakers that said if you did something bad we're gonna separate you from everybody so you can go be penitent until you change your way of thinking. And see, that that is a whole uh, reformative way of thinking rather than punitive that we're just gonna, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're that, the, you know, as you were saying, the laundry pile got bigger. As you kept talking, the, the laundry pile got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what we do is we decide to just ignore the laundry altogether. We're just gonna say, we're just gonna plow this over. We're gonna forget about that, you know, and, um, and, and, and from any political persuasion, there's a university in, in uh, uh, here in America, it's the University of Michigan, they have set up now separate gathering places for safety's sake. And I'm thinking, we should be screaming and yelling and saying, so that's our answer? Our answer is to bring back segregation, you know, and think that that's somehow the the higher path i mean you know it, it, if the kids don't get along in the sandbox make them separate sandboxes right. you know it, it's it, it, you know but for us as believers i think that we, using the big laundry pile illustration is that we can only start with one piece of laundry at yeah. a time and and that i you know in other words for past for a pastor in a community in a diverse community like bakersfield is that I have to just look at where our context of ministry is and say, well, how did that person ever get, you know, we're, we're going to be, we'll talk about this in a minute, <clears throat> we're going to be handing out food, you know, to people that are in unfortunate situations. And the last thing we need to, well, how'd you, uh, 
you know, how'd you get in this situation? It doesn't matter. I'm hungry and I'm homeless. Right. Uh, I, I've been a prison chaplain in the past. And hardly anyone in prison wants to have a conversation of, hey, by the way, chaplain, here's how I ended up in prison. People don't want to talk about things that have caused shame and pain in their life. And that's not the time, you know, for that particular, doesn't matter, like you're saying, it doesn't matter right now in the in the crisis, we, this help people to get out of crisis, you know, and uh, really appreciate you being vulnerable about that. I mean, again, these are, these are needful conversations that we, that we're not actually going to do in one YouTube video. They're really conversations that we need to expand out to families everywhere so that we, you know, um, you know, white guilt doesn't help anybody and black pride alone doesn't help anybody. For us to understand that Christ has risen us from the ash heap and made us one of his, and then I can really learn to appreciate cultural differences, cultural appreciation, yeah. uh, uh, the, the joy of, uh, you know, learning someone else's story. It's an exciting journey right. to really learn and appreciate someone. But but it also ever since that day uh, when when we sat in the office, here's what it does for me, and I think we can all learn from this. Is you know just as much as if I were to see someone broken down the side of the road, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is that now I'm hyper vigilant. You know, in other words, I've got young men of African descent in my congregation. I have young men uh, of Spanish descent in my congregation. I've got, uh, I've got people of Filipino, uh, uh, you know, ethnicity in our congregation. And what this does is, you know, we're not having the, um, <laughs> you know, we're not going to be goofy and weird about this kind of stuff. You can be goofy and weird, you know, can I touch your hair? <laughs> you can probably tell me a "Can I touch your hair?" story. That that's a that, you know, but we can be vigilant. We can be aware. Awareness creates great conversations. Absolutely. So uh, one of the hats that Cat wears, Cat in the hat, is to uh, be a uh, uh, our our go team. Director, so let's talk about that, and then we'll how people can get involved. Okay, so Go Team is um, something that Pastor asked me to spearhead here at the church, and it's just the missions department for Southwest Christian Center. There wasn't one before, and um, once he came, he kind of like streamlined everything and broke everything down into um, different areas of not just interest but of need. Where where we can get involved everywhere in the church and so he asked me if I would head the missions department and prayerfully I accept it and so so far we've been just working on trying to get our feet on the ground with missions work how can we be the hands and feet of God in today's world in a world that um, is so hurting and so after Pastor came here, um, maybe a few months in, we started the prayer network. And he had us all, he had um, several people get involved with the prayer network. And basically that's where we take phone calls one night a week for two hours. So it's not much, one night a week for two hours we take phone calls. And um, it comes through on your cell phone and you just pray for people. There's no qualifications, just, well, there's one qualification, just the love for Jesus. Um, and then I guess the second one would be a love for others. Mm -hmm. So we get on and we pray. And during this, this time, um, which I already knew that there was, a, the, this is a world of hurting people. I was already aware of that. Um, I don't think that. Uh, Christianity would be so popular if this was not a world of hurting people mm -hmm. but from being on the phone since almost since the pandemic started to now um, there's so many different needs and so many different hurts and so many so many 
people and it kind of puts your life into perspective mm -hmm. sitting there talking to other people and, and hearing what they have to say and hearing their needs it really helps you kind of navigate your life a little better because you see that other people are truly um, desperate for God and so um, with with that it's helped me open up what we can do here locally so it's given me ideas of what we can do here in Bakersfield. So being on the phone kind of transitioned me to being able to see, okay, there's needs in foster care, there's needs in the school, there's, these are the types of calls that we're getting. People are asking for these prayers. And so, um, and you know, there's, there's so much more, battered women, and uh, I mean, there's a, a long list, right. laundry list of needs out there. And so, hearing them come in on the phone and actively seeing that people what people are needing is is better able for me to see um here in bakersfield what we could launch you know and i'm taking those things to pastor and he's like yes i love it let's do it <laughs> he's more hyper than i am about getting involved so this month we have coming up on the 27th um we're having a local outreach at Patriots Park on Ming. And we're going to be there from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. We're going to grill up some hot dogs, pass out some chips and some drinks, and have people come out and give their testimony. We are having Feed My Sheep. They're going to um, be a part of it with us. Um, we're going to have our loud microphone out there. I've talked to a couple of our worship singers. So Damati and um, her mom have agreed to come out there for us. Um, I uh, have another person in mind that I'm going to be speaking to. I don't want to say her name just in case she's busy that day. But um, <laughs> yeah, when we get it on video, then they're pressured. <laughs> she might agree, no, you're right. <laughs> Deborah Riley. Okay, so we're going to <laughs> we're going to get some singers out there, and the plan is just to love on people. Um, I don't care if I don't care if they just come for. A hot dog or a drink as long as they're there God is going to do the work we just have to be there and be the feet be the hands and he will work <laughs> if we show up he'll work even if we don't show up what was it the even if nobody would have sang, the rocks would have still sang. that's right that's so right. even if we don't show up God's gonna do God's gonna be God mm -hmm. so um, I hope that you guys can all come out and just be a part of it be a part if you want to give your testimony or you can um, just come and listen to some worship songs and help us pass out some food. You're going to be blessed by being a part of this, definitely. And anything more you want to know about, you know, whatever ministries we have going on, it's www.meetatthecross.com, and then that crawls across the screen for you to see that as well. By the way, the, the, the prayer number is 844-984-2463, and that's also there on the screen for you to see that 24 hours a day that you can call in for prayer, yes. and we are definitely seeing some uh, tremendous uh, uh, things that God's doing. So um, we just want to uh, wrap it up for now. I, again, this is such a cool show because we never know which direction uh, that we're going to go in, but uh, we're super glad that uh, Kat was with us today and be watching out for us but before we do that um would you be feel comfortable praying for people today yeah absolutely um heavenly father i just want to praise your mighty name you are so so worthy to be praised you are a miracle worker and a way maker um every time i have asked you to show up you have shown up more than what i expected and i'm just so thankful to be your child today and I just want to pray over anybody that this message touches, whatever their need might be, Lord, that you would meet them in that need. Show up abundantly, tremendously for them as you have done so consistently in the past. Um, you are the way and the life, and I'm just so thankful to have you. I praise your name. I give you the glory. And I just pray that this message just reaches out and just touches your children. And... Um, I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for that. And thank you for being a part of this. If you don't know Jesus, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved yes. today. Until we see you next time, it's Pastor Darius saying, you are blessed of the Lord.